and welcome back to the channel. My name is Zoelle, and this is your Monday Night Raw review for February 17th, 2020. And let me just put a big disclaimer out. Um, the main event is beginning, and as I wrote on Twitter, I'm not watching this shit. Because, like Seth Rollins said, I thought we had enough of the Viking Raiders, Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe, AOP, Buddy Murphy. I thought we were done. Like Rollins said, phase one was over. So I don't understand why we have to sit through another fucking six man, two man handicap one on one, a fist fight, or whatever. Why do we have to continue to sit around? And watch the same old match over and over and over again. I refuse. So I'm not watching it. So I'm just going to do my review. And this will just be a first because it's early as hell. It's not even 11 o'clock yet. So anyway, we opened up the night with a Randy Orton promo. Now, I caught the tail end of this. Um, my streams were not working, but I did find a working one. And I basically caught the part where Randy proceeds to beat the shit out of Matt Hardy with a chair. He said something about loving Edge like a brother, and he didn't mean to, you know, it hurt him to hurt Edge, you know, stuff like that. So he beats Matt over the back with a chair repeatedly, and then he concertos Matt on the steel steps. That was the second time he concertoed him in the ring first. And I just want to say that the Washington crowd, I think they're in Washington, don't quote me on that. The crowd were just complete fucking savages because they kept egging Randy on to get, um, to give Matt more RKOs, like one more, one more. And then they started chanting, Randy's going to kill you, so... This was a great opening segment. My only gripe is that the refs took fucking forever to come out. And when they did, they just kind of stood aside and watched Randy Orton beat the shit out of Matt Hardy. So, um, and then, you know, the little, the little attention to detail, like Randy was yelling, I'm sorry, after he gave Matt Hardy the second concerto. So, and then we went to commercial. So, I guess this is the WWE's way of writing Matt out, but they could have easily just written him out with a loss to Randy and their supposed no holds bar match they were supposed to have tonight. But I feel like, not looking back on the segment, I just feel like this is kind of Vince's way of saying, like, fuck you, Matt, on his way out, because this was like 10 times more brutal than it was supposed to. When it's supposed to be. Like, I get that it adds to Randy's character and what he's been doing. But I just feel like it was just, mm, it was, it was okay. But then it was just a little much after. Like, you, like, they gave him an inch, you took a mile kind of thing. So, um, and when, and when they came back from commercial, just the silence in the arena, I felt like that really, really added to the segment like people were just in shock and they didn't know what to say so the that segment was just fucking awesome so and i kind of never want randy orton to ever be a face ever again because he's just like a natural natural heel so then we go to the first match which is eric roman and alistair black alistair black started the match off with a flying knee strike he sends roman to the outside of the ring he misses a moonsault from the top rope. Roman hits a splash for a two count. He gets um, another two count after a drop kick that fucking barely touched Black, but Black sold it like he was hit by a ton of bricks. Roman hits a pump handle backbreaker. He puts uh, Aleister Black in a bear hug. And then we fast forward to the end of the match, and Roman lands a powerbomb for a two count, but Aleister reverses his iron claw choke slam. And after two black masses, Aleister Black gets the three count. So Aleister Black is your winner. Um, I said this on Twitter. I know that Eric Rowan is supposed to be billed as some monster or whatever, and he's unbeat. You know, he hasn't been beat up until now. But I just don't think he should have gotten in as much offense as he did against Aleister Black. So that was my only gripe. It's not much of a gripe because I really just don't. I didn't care about this match at all. 
Um, then we go to Charlotte Flair's. Again, the noise. Just fucking disrespectful. I do it late, I get noise. I do it early, I get noise. Whatever. So anyway, we go to Charlotte Flair. And her in-ring promo, and as soon as she walked out, I gagged. I just can't stand her. Anyway, she says that she went to Portland, NXT, take over Portland, to see who was filling Rhea Ripley's head up with the idea that she can come to Raw and challenge the Queen. She said that she was impressed, and watching made her reminisce on how her class of NXT women built what is the foundation of NXT now. She says that what she hates is the entitlement that comes with the fact that Rhea Ripley thinks she can come to her show, quote unquote, and hold the title in her face. She says that Rhea Ripley is good and said that pride comes before the fall and she's going to humble Rhea at WrestleMania. She says everyone is the next big thing until they're not. And she woos and her music plays and then the segment ends. I don't really give a shit what uh, Charlotte was talking about. Um, I just find it fucking hilarious that someone like Charlotte Flair is talking about the entitlement when all she literally had to do was remove her mole, get unnecessary breast implants, and woo her way through the door and straight to the main event. So, you know, it's it's just, it's I cackle. It's hilarious for her to talk about someone being entitled and she has a problem with that. Like, bitch, we have a problem with everything that you do because you, you don't earn any of it. So, in the words of the true queen, Bianca Belair, girl, uh-uh. So, anyway, then we had a triple threat match for the 24-7 title between R-Truth, Riddick Moss, and Mojo Rawley. None of these guys got um, televised entrances, so that already tells you what uh, the people in the back think of this match. Um, Mojo Rawley breaks up a pin attempt by Moss. He throws him into the barricade. Our truth starts doing John Cena's five moves of death. Rawley wiggles out of the F5. He goes for a pin attempt, and then Riddick Moss sneaks in, and he gets the three count. So Riddick Moss retains the 24-7 title, and... He retained in a match that nobody gave a shit about. So, anyway, Drew McIntyre versus MVP next. Before the match, Drew takes the mic and he says that there's 48, I think he said 48 days. His accent, like, it was really thick. I think he said 48 days until WrestleMania. But since Charlotte already pointed at the sign, he asks the crowd if they want to point at the sign with him. And they do the one, two, three, which Drew calls the Claymore countdown. I just cringe because I feel like, okay, we get it. You're likable. You're a face. Just stop pandering to the crowd. Like, that's not that's not what we want to see. So he says that Suplex City is located in Claymore County. And he is demolishing that bitch to the ground. And leaving as a WWE champion. There was a lot of cursing on this show. A lot of cursing. I mean, I liked it. Because obviously I'm a fucking adult. But I just noticed it was just a lot of cursing. So... Paul Heyman interrupts. He introduces Brock Lesnar, but then apologizes because obviously we know that Brock Lesnar is not there because if he was, he would have been promoted as being on the show. Like, we're not idiots, Paul. But he says that he just wanted Drew to know what it's like to hear that and come WrestleMania, he will hear and still after Brock retains against Ricochet at Super Showdown and when he F5s Drew at WrestleMania. Drew says that Paul Heyman can say Brock's name at lunch, before the match, after the match, while they're getting pedicures together, but he'll be saying it after he kicks Brock's head off at WrestleMania. Paul Heyman then introduces MVP. MVP takes a mic and he says that he treated Drew with an elite level of respect. I like the little play on words. He thought that they were old friends, but Drew interrupts and says that he repaid him by kicking his head off last week. So MVP says... Drew cheap shot at him, and he's going to whoop Drew's ass tonight. Well, I don't think he said ass, but that's what I took from the segment. So MVP hits a big boot to Drew before the bell rings. Drew no sells. The bell then rings, and then Drew delivers a big boot of his own. He hits a future shock DDT, Claymore kick, three count, and Drew McIntyre wins. So I don't even think this match was 15 minutes. If it was, 
I'm surprised. But, you know, Drew continues to look good going towards WrestleMania, which to me, if I'm using my logic, as good as he looks now, he's definitely probably going to lose to Brock. But I feel like the appeal to this match is Brock has somebody that can actually stand up to him. And I feel like if they really want to pull the trigger on Drew, like, this match can go either way. So, that's where my interest level is at. And I feel like, you know, we'll be in for a really, really good match. So, Becky Lynch. She comes out holding a bag and she says that she's been feeling a lot of things lately. And she came to this country for fame and fortune. She, has, she says she has no use for fame. But fortune... She has a pretty good idea, and she starts dumping $100 bills in a ring. I was trying to look to see if they were legit. They look legit. And I'm surprised no fan jumped over the barricade to take the bills because, you know, my broke ass definitely would have. <laughs> no shade. But she said that's her down payment for what she's going to do to Shanna Baszler. She says that only animals go for the neck to weaken their prey. And then she asks Shanna if her pretty face looks like prey. I didn't understand where... She was going with that. But anyway, Shane appears on the big screen and she laughs. She says that she's in the Elimination Chamber match. And the match is actually inside of a cage, which is where she came from. You know, with the MMA background and stuff. She says that everything is practically laid out for her to win. And she didn't plan her attack last week. But you can just imagine the kind of things she does have planned. She said she's going to tear the living shit out of Becky. Becky says she'll be watching closely and rooting for Shayna to win. <clears throat> my thoughts were this segment was really well done. I mean, Shayna, from if you were watching from NXT, I mean, she's a beast. You know, she's pushed as this unstoppable MMA uh, submission machine. Sorry, Samoa Joe. But, you know, and this feud with Becky, I mean, when Becky is invested, we get really, really, if not one of the best promos out of her. And Shayna Baszler winning the elimina Elimination Chamber obviously makes sense. I mean, the story between her kind of just wrote itself. You know, Shayna being Ronda Rousey's best friend and Becky beating Ronda and their, you know, their personal back and forth words during their feud. I mean, it just, I feel like with this match, they kind of have the chance to right the wrong that happened at Survivor Series because I was legit happy to see Shayna and Becky in the same ring you know it didn't it didn't turn out the way that you know the 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 higher ups wanted but I mean you know this time around you know maybe we'll have a chance to really really see you know a really good back and forth match between those two I doubt Shayna will actually win the title from Becky but you know I'm still rooting for her I, I like Shayna I know there's a lot of people who don't really care for her but I really like her um, then we had a backstage segment with Lana Lashley, Zelina Vega, and Angel Garza, and Charlie Caruso. I didn't pay attention to this, um, backstage segment. Um, I know Lana said something stupid. Um, I was, and Angel Garza said something I couldn't really understand because of his accent. And I just, what I took away from this was Zelina Vega is fucking gorgeous. That's, that's it. That's all I took, just being honest. So anyway, that leads us to a tag team match between Angel Garza and Bobby Lashley versus Rusev and Humberto Carrillo. Um, I didn't really care for this match, but I did take some notes, so let me do my due diligence. Humberto and Lashley start off the match. Lashley hits a shoulder tackle before tagging in Garza. Garza works over Carrillo's arm before Carrillo hits a top rope splash. Rusev comes in and stops Lashley from interfering. That that uh, sequence looked kind of like miscommunication. It didn't look like it looked like Rusev wasn't supposed to run in or something like that. It just looked awkward. Um, Garza hits a drop kick and then he rips off his pants and he throws them at Rusev on the apron. Carrillo hits a suicide dive on Garza while a female fan was kissing him on the cheek. I mean, I guess that's part of his gimmick. You know, I like him. He's okay. Just, just wasn't a fan of this match at all. So, Carrillo tags in Rusev and Lashley tags in Garza. He splashes Garza in the corner. He hits two uh, belly to belly suplexes. Lashley breaks up the pin attempt. Garza tries to roll up Rusev. Garza hits a super kick. 
Carrillo breaks up the pin attempt. Lashley hits a really, really nice looking spare on Carrillo outside of the ring. Garza hits an insecurity to Rusev, who is on the top rope. Rusev lands a headbutt, got a two count. Garza reverses Rusev's accolade, and he pushes Rusev into Lashley, who was standing on the apron. Rusev instead turns that into a Machka kick, and Garza rolls up Rusev for the three count. I know I kind of just skimmed through that, but I really didn't. Like I said, I don't care for this match. And your winners are Angel Garza and Bobby Lashley. I don't really have anything to say. I just hope that this is the last we see of Angel Garza tagging with Bobby Lashley. I don't want him and Zelina Vega anywhere near this fucking shit stain that is called Bobby Lashley and Lana. And as far as Rusev, he loses yet again. And I just feel like this guy is 1000% on his way out of this fucking company. And I really, really pray that he leaves because... Even if he doesn't even go to AEW, like, he just needs to get far, far the fuck away from WWE. Next, we had Natalya versus Kyrie Sane, and I'm pretty sure this is supposed to uh, follow up that match that Natalya had with Asuka, where Asuka kicked fucking Natalya's eye right out of its socket. So Asuka and Kyrie come out making fun of Natalia's black eye. Asuka says that she's going to win the ro uh, the Elimination Chamber. I'm sorry, look at me. And she taunts Natalia. I just cackled because Asuka and Kyrie Sane are fucking awesome. Like, I'm going to say it every week. I tweeted it. I'm going to say it every fucking week. So Natalia misses a discus clothesline. Kyrie slaps Natalia. Natalia hits her with a stalling suplex. She gets a two count. Kyrie breaks up the sharpshooter attempt by grabbing the bottom rope. Natalia is distracted with the ref, and Kyrie hits a spinning elbow. Natalia is um, on the apron when Asuka tries to interfere. Kyrie knocks her off, and then Asuka kicks the shit out of Natalia's head. And the ref counts to 10, and Kyrie Sane wins by count out. Like I said, nothing really interesting. You know, I love Kyrie Sane, I love Asuka. Um, the fact that they're still women's tag team champion doesn't really say much because there is no women tag team division. So I guess if you have to keep the titles on someone, put them on two women that can actually fucking wrestle. Um, I don't really care for Natalia. I think she's boring as fuck. I think she's stale as fuck. And I was happy to see Asuka kick her head off. You know, I wish... They would come up with some storyline injury where, like, Natalia gets amnesia and she forgets that she's part of the Hart family. She actually develops a fucking personality and she ditches that terrible ass gear that is just not flattering for her at all. Because she does have a nice shape. So, I would like to see her in anything other than a bodysuit. Like, I just feel like she's hot as hell in that thing. So... You know, after all that happened, maybe I'll like Natalia again. But until then, that car. Like, I'm just annoyed. Anyway, until then, just get Natalia Nyhart off my screen. Then we had Seth Rollins and his sermon. Buddy Murphy introduces him. And I'm going to continue calling him Buddy Murphy because it's a force of habit. So don't kill me. Rollins comes out and he thanks Murphy for his introduction. He thanks the crowd for making him the Monday Night Messiah. I do not want to hear that word again. That name, that whatever. I don't want to hear it again. He says that he did not come up with the word sermon. It was from the powers that be, which means Vince McMahon and Paul Heyman, I guess. And he said that all he did was request a couple of minutes to say some garbage. Well, he didn't say that. I, I wrote that. So, yeah, just, just, just follow me. Um, the crowd starts booing him before he can even speak he literally starts saying ladies and gentlemen and he starts preaching and he says that they are here that they are here to celebrate progress and phase one encountered some resistance which he expected but they completed phase one when they vanquished small joe kevin owens and the viking raiders or so we thought or so we fucking thought he says that him, AOP, and Buddy Murphy prove that you can achieve anything you put your mind to. So how, just here's my suggestion. How about the creative, the creative team uh, puts their mind to stop giving us the same fucking main event every week? And maybe they can achieve it. 
because I'm tired of seeing this shit, which is why I'm not watching the main event now. And I'm doing this uh, review. He says that the work now begins and he does not take the responsibility of being the Monday Night Messiah lightly. Phase two will not be easy and then the crowd starts chanting, you suck. He said, but it is necessary because it, it is time for the greater good. He says that it is now time to seek out the weak and the lesser than and the non-compliant. He says that he needs to rehabilitate the flaws in the system and eradicate them if he must. And the way that Seth was using these big ass words, I am pretty sure Paul Heyman wrote this, wrote this promo. Like I can bet my next paycheck that he wrote this. This just reeks of something that Paul Heyman would be saying as he's trying to get uh, Brock Lesnar over. Um, he says that this is not a promise, threat, or a warning. It comes from his heart. This is the gospel. I, I really thought he was going to say this is the gospel of Rollins. And by then I was going to turn, I was going to turn it off. I was going to turn it off. And if there are any WWE superstars that remain non-compliant, they will suffer the same fate. And I literally forgot what he said when the Viking Raiders music hit. I just... I just literally said, what the fuck? Like, again? Uh, Seth Rollins escapes the ring, and while he's standing on the stage, Kevin, Co uh, Kevin Owens comes out and gives him a stunner. I just... Like, they, do they literally have nothing, nothing else to do with Kevin Owens and the Viking Raiders. Like, I'm glad Samoa Joe's not here, so I can't really be mad at him. But I feel like if he was there, or if he was booked on the show, he would easily have been in this match. And I just cannot understand, like, why do we have to continue seeing this same fucking main event over and over and over and over again? We get it. We get it. We get it. I mean, ugh. I mean, before he was interrupted, Seth Rollins, to me, was just sounding a lot like what CM Punk and his straight of society was supposed to be. You know, a ripoff. I mean, it. Seth Rollins sounds, you know, I'm starting to like what he's saying, but he just sounds you know, like a CM Punk wannabe. And I feel like his back and forth with CM Punk just like, come on, just make the match already. Like, if I have to beg Punk to just come back to do one match, like, please. I will harass him on Twitter or whatever it is. Like, please. Um, yeah, so the Viking Raiders came out and they ruined this segment. So I just, you know, at that point I just stopped caring. I really did. So, um, uh, I don't even know. So anyway, we had a backstage segment with Seth Rollins, AOP, Buddy Murphy, and Charlie. And Seth says that, of course, a six-man tag match. Because that's what the crowd wanted. Because that's what we were all dying to fucking see. So then AJ Styles and the OC have an in-ring promo. I was really happy to see AJ Styles back in the ring. Um... AJ says that he's back because what would WrestleMania season be without the phenomenal one? Carl Anderson says that AJ is the new Miss, Mr. WrestleMania. AJ says that he's the greatest superstar on the roster. And when he wins that gauntlet at Super Showdown, he's going to say who's next as long as the WWE champion is available. And he says that he doesn't care if that's Brock, Ricochet, Drew, Hulk Hogan, Shawn Michaels, Roman Reigns. Razor Ramon, the NWO, Sting. I mean, you know, AJ and the OC are supposed to be heels, but, you know, they can be entertaining when they want to be. And AJ is such a good a good promo, so, yeah. Um, Ricochet interrupts, and you can just hear a collective fuck go across the world. Um, AJ doesn't even let Ricochet speak. He says that he was just joking when he said Ricochet's name because no one actually believes that he'll be that he'll become WWE champion. He asks what Ricochet has done to even get an opportunity at the championship. And Ricochet starts talking and that's when I blanked out. Uh, AJ and the OC start laughing, so I'm, I assume Ricochet must have made a joke or said something funny. 
uh, oh yeah, Ricochet says that he's going to beat Brock, which I started laughing with AJ and OC, but I, my laugh was a lot louder and a lot more ignorant because who does Ricochet, who's writing this terrible shit for him? Like, it can't be Paul. It has to be Vince. Like, why do they continue to send this man out and just embarrass him? Like, ugh. Ricochet challenges AJ to a match, but Carl Anderson says that he's the toughest man in the building, and he accepts on AJ's behalf. They have a match. I don't even think this match went 15 minutes. Uh, Ricochet wins. I literally wrote in my notes that I didn't pay attention to this match because Ricochet has literally soured on me. They have literally stripped away everything that made Ricochet stand out in NXT and on the indies, and they made him this corny, sappy, athletic, doof, like, doofus. Like, I just... Like, I miss the days where he just didn't speak, you know. I miss when Dream came out and said that anything Ricochet can do, the Dream can do better. And he did that flip from inside the ring to outside the ring and just looked at Dream. And he, I think he maybe said two or three words. But that's all you need. Like, now they are sending Ricochet out with these Vince promos and he just sounds like a fucking idiot. Like, <sighs> Anyway, then we have a backstage promo with Liv Morgan and Charlie Caruso. And I, I assume Charlie asked Liv about uh, Ruby Riot returning two weeks ago and attacking her. I assume Liv said something. Didn't really care because I was on my way to turning this shit off. Because, yeah, the ending of this show just fucking sucked. So, I think Liv, I heard Liv say something like in... She's eliminating Ruby for the from the elimination chamber and challenging Becky for the title, or she's gonna become the the Raw Women's Champion. And I just that's when I really clocked out. Like, girl, okay, <laughs> you continue to dream big, sis, <laughs> because um, when you get eliminated from the elimination chamber, you'll go back to having two minute matches with Lana and being the confused bisexual stalker crazy emo chick like you should like they should have just kept her gimmick from the riot squad i don't know what this was but yeah that is your monday night raw review like i said i did not pay attention to the main event because i refused to allow this company to continue insulting my intelligence as if i asked to see Kevin Owens and the Viking Raiders or Kevin Owens, Samoa Joe and the Viking Raiders or Samoa Joe and the Viking Raiders or Samoa Joe and Kevin Owens against Seth Rollins, Buddy Murphy and AOP. We've, it's been done to death. We've seen it 5,000 times. We get it. We know that Seth Rollins and company is going to win. That's it. But I did take a quick glance at my phone and I saw that the Street Profits helped Kevin Owens and the Viking Raiders. I don't know what purpose that was for because they should have had the Street Profits in the Viking Raiders position from the jump. The Viking Raiders have nothing to do with this. And they were champions before they got involved with Seth Rollins and company. So, like, why do we need four big men? Like... It just, it just didn't look good. They didn't gel well. And there was no real reason why they were helping. So, yeah, those are my thoughts. And that's my review. So, please, like, like. You hear me? Look at me. I'm going to bed. So, please, like, comment, and subscribe. And I'll see you guys on Wednesday for AEW Dynamite. Love you. Bye.